Today you walked another mile down the pathway that's leading you home. And you met many travelers along the way, both strangers and friends that you've known. And often you stop to talk for a while to those you've met on the way. But friend, did you mention the name of the Lord to someone you talk with today? Did you tell someone about Jesus? Did you mention his name to a friend? Did you warn the stranger who's lost and undone that death is the wages of sin? Did you show them the plan of salvation? Did you tell them he's coming again? Did you talk about Jesus, all the things of this world? Did you tell someone about him? Some traveler you may meet today may walk down this pathway no more. For this could be their final mile until their journey's o'er. How sweet it would be to meet him again in heaven some glad day. And hear him say, I made it through, for he told me about Jesus one day. Did you tell someone about Jesus? Did you mention his name to a friend? Did you warn the stranger who's lost and undone that death is the wages of sin? Did you show them the plan of salvation? Did you tell them he's coming again? Did you talk about Jesus or the things of this world? Did you tell someone about him? Did you talk about Jesus or the things of this world? Did you tell someone about him? Amen. Amen. Thank you, ladies, for that. Appreciate that. Let's take our Bibles this morning. Book of 2 Kings, chapter 6. 2 Kings, chapter 6. I was encouraged yesterday. Carol and I were talking on the phone, and she was just relating to me the opportunity she had to be a witness to her doctor. And she said she'd prayed and asked the Lord for an opportunity to speak to someone that day. And God was gracious and good enough to give her that opportunity. And uh, he would do it for all of us. Amen. And... Uh, our, our role here as Christians on this earth really is to tell others about Jesus and give them the opportunity to be saved as well. Second Kings chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6. If you found your place, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. I'll read a few verses here and we'll pray and uh, we'll be seated. Second Kings chapter 6, <clears throat> verse number 30. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the women that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold he had sackcloth upon, uh, sorry, within upon his flesh. Then he said, go do so and more, God do so and more also to me if the hand of Elisha the son of Shaphat shall stand on him this day. But Elisha sat in his house and the elders sat with him and the king sent a man from before him but ere the messenger came to him he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer hath sent to take away mine head? Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door, hold him fast at the door, is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down under him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? Verse number 32, that last part there is where I get the title of the message. Elisha says, When the messenger cometh, Shut the door. The title of the message is this, Somebody Shut the Door. Somebody Shut the Door. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. As we open the Word of God, as we read the Scriptures and then attempt to preach, God, we pray that you would help us. As the hymn writer said, All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One come down. And we certainly need your help this morning, Holy Spirit. Not just in our singing and giving our tithes and offerings, but also in the listening and in the preaching of the word of God. We ask God that you'd breathe upon us. I ask that you'd speak to my heart, to the heart of the people here under the sound of my voice. And I pray as always that you would be glorified and exalted this morning. I pray that you would challenge us and I pray God you'd have your will and way 
in our hearts and lives this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As children growing up, one of the things that we would hear our mother shouting out quite regularly was, Somebody shut the door. Who's left the door open? The flies are coming in. And uh, I was thinking about that um, during the week and I thought nothing much has changed because in our household, instead of my mum shouting it out, often we hear Tracy shouting out, Somebody shut the door. Who's left the door open? The flies are coming in. Well, the dog's got to get in and out, so we've got to leave the door open. But we understand if we leave the door open all the time, there are some unwanted nasties that come in the house that we just don't want there. We leave the back door open for the dog to come in and go out, but then the flies come in and we've got to shut the door again. And uh, the houses today aren't built with fly screens and security screens so much on the front door. Ours hasn't anyway, so you can't leave the front door open and let the breeze blow through because the flies come in and ants come in and all sorts of things come in and mice come in. So we have to shut the door for a reason, and that's to keep the nasties and the unwanted out of our house. And when I was thinking about this passage, when I was reading it a while back, if we were to get a little bit of background of what's happening here, King Ben-Hadad, king of Samaria, is going through a very troublesome time. Samaria is in the grip of drought. Jerusalem, I think it was Jerusalem, is being besieged and they're eating asses' heads and Uh, going out to the shop and buying a cab of dove's dung just to eat that to keep themselves going. Now, I don't know about you, Uh, we're changing our diet a little bit and we're trying to do some clean eating, but if Tracy ever come home with a cab of dove's dung, that's it. I'm going back to eating Hungry Jacks and McDonald's and KFC. I don't know how anyone could eat dove's dung, but, you know, and even donkey's heads and so forth, but that's not as bad as what it got to. It got to that bad that there were women that were killing their children and eating them. And uh, one of the women had killed their son. She'd conspired with another lady and said, listen, if we eat your son today and tomorrow, we'll eat your son. And of course, the next day came and the other woman took off. She was nowhere to be seen. And, and uh, the king saw it and he's got sackcloth and ashes on him and he's disgusted and dejected and turns his attention towards Elisha and wants to kill him, wants to chop his head off because he thinks the man of God is to be blamed for everything. Not much unlike our day today, is it? The man of God is blamed for everything. But anyway, he sends a messenger before to go to Elisha and Elisha's sitting in his house with all the elders. He's not perturbed by it. He's uh, just sitting there and calm as a cucumber and he's talking with the elders there and he makes a statement and he says, listen... The king's sending a messenger, and when he comes, you better shut the door and hold that door fast and keep the messenger at the door. In other words, he's saying, shut the door and don't let him in. We don't want him to come in. He's got a message from the king, and we just don't want to hear that. And of course, Elisha says, hold him fast at the door. He says, because the king is hot on his heels. He's coming after him, and uh, Elisha said, we don't need to hear that. We don't need to hear this message. And you know, folks, if we want to experience revival in our homes and in our lives, and if we want to experience revival in our church and churches, somebody better shut the door. Somebody better shut the door and stop letting Satan's messengers in, spreading their wickedness. And, uh, you know, we might think, well, we shut the door and we'll keep the flies out and so forth. And, you know, when you're a new church and you have people come along and they're a little bit inquisitive, you want to open the door and invite everybody in because you want to see the church growing. And the uh, fact of the matter is, and uh, you start a church and Satan also has his messengers that he wants to send around and come in and spread some wickedness and do things and uh, unsavory things and do all sorts of, uh, spread all sorts of false doctrine and so forth. And we need to shut the door. And we need to shut the door on the devil because the devil has his messengers. And if we allow these messengers to come into our hearts and lives, and if we are, listen folks, do you know you and I, if we're not careful, we can be tools for Satan? Do you know that the messengers that I'm going to speak of this morning, you and I can be messengers that preach and teach this same message that I'm going to preach this morning? And if we're not careful, we need to shut the door of our homes and not let Satan in. And we need to shut the door of this church and not let him or his messengers in either. 
It was the Apostle Paul that said in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse number 7, he says, Unless I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now everyone debates about what this thorn in the flesh is. Theologians for years have debated it, and I'll give you the answer right now. It was the messenger of Satan. The messenger of Satan sent to buffet me that, it should, that I should be exalted above measure. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, something very painful, something that's hard to deal with. And Paul says it was the messenger of Satan. Do you know that Satan has his messengers this morning? Do you know if you're not careful, if you don't shut the door of your heart to the messengers of Satan, that he'll start sowing wrong thoughts and concepts and wrong things in your life? Do you know that the messengers of Satan are designed to stop you in your tracks and to mess with your head and get you all discouraged? You know, the Apostle Paul said to us in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 27, Neither give place to the devil. Now he's writing to Christians right there. And you and I, if we're not careful, we can give place to the devil. In other words, what we do is we just say, Satan, why don't you just come on into our home? Satan, why don't you just come on in? Satan, why don't you just come into our church and do all sorts of things? And if we're not careful, our attitudes and, and our thoughts and our words are open, open the door for Satan to come in and somebody needs to shut the door this morning. I want to give you a few things just by way of introduction that we need to do in order to shut the door. In other words, firstly, we need to make a decision to shut the door. We need to make a decision this morning, folks, that we're just going to shut the door to, the, to Satan's messengers and not let him in our homes. Uh, you need to make a decision this morning to shut the door to Satan's messengers and not let him mess with your head. And we as God's people, as God's preachers, we need to make a decision to shut that door and not let Satan and his messages in here and come and preach things that we don't want in this church. Amen. And that means having to be a little bit uh, tough at times and that means to, uh, to stand here and, and preach thus saith the Lord in order to chase the messengers of Satan out. But we need to make a decision to shut the door. Secondly, you need courage to follow up on that decision. Uh, it's one thing to make a decision and how many times have you and I made a decision not followed through with it? But if you and I are going to shut the door to Satan and his messengers, we need, to, we need to have the courage to follow through with that. We need to get up and say, no, we don't want that in this house. No, we don't want that in our home. No, I don't want that in my life. No, we don't want that in this church. Somebody ought to shut the door to Satan and his messengers. And we need to decide to do that. We need to have courage to do that. And you need strength to keep that door shut. Did you notice what it said in verse number 32? When the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. In other words, he's going to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying to get into this church. He's going to keep trying to get into your life. He's going to try to get into your homes, but you need to shut the door and you need to hold that door fast. You need strength. Amen. You know, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 10, he said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1, thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Listen, you cannot stop Satan in your own strength. You cannot stop his messengers in your own strength. You need the strength of Almighty God on your life. And I want to tell you something. And if you and I are not walking with God, and if we're not right with God, we're not going to have his strength on our life. And, and we're going to try in vain to keep Satan at the door. He's just going to keep coming in and in. Lastly, you need to be dedicated into keeping that door shut. Dedicated. You need to persist. You need to hold fast. You need to be there. I like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my brethren, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Listen, when you know that the messengers of Satan are coming to this door or the door of your house or the door of your life, you need to be steadfast and unmovable and hold him fast at the door. I mean, the messenger is just the forerunner of Satan, just like John the Baptist was Christ's messenger, the forerunner of the living Christ that was coming into the world. Listen, we ought to not fool ourselves and tell ourselves Satan has his messengers too. And, you know, when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I think it is, they, they, they act as uh, uh, children of light. They pose themselves as uh, ministers of righteousness. Listen, they wear suits. They carry King James Bibles. They look the part. They have nice uh, short hair for men and, and they look modest as women and all these sorts of things. But listen, you and I better have the discerning of spirits today because Satan's messengers are trying to infiltrate every Christian home and every life and every church today. I sometimes sit and ponder and think about my life and I go through our home and I think, are we doing things in our home that are letting the enemy in? 
Are we listening to things on the radio that Satan is using to infiltrate our thoughts and our minds? Are we watching things or are we allowing things in our home through the television that will seek to uh, quench the Spirit of God? I was reading this morning in 2 Chronicles in uh, chapter 10. Uh, Saul's sad ending well, he, when he falls on his own sword and David rises to the occasion he becomes king. And he wants to seek the ark and bring it back and inquire of the ark because all of the, the, uh, the, the, the life of Saul, they never inquired at the ark of God. And so David wanted to bring the ark back. And of course, you know the account. Uzzah tries to stop it from falling off the wagon. God kills him. David mourns and laments over that, takes the ark to Obed-Edom's house. And the ark represents the presence and power of God. And while the ark was at Obed-Edom's house, his house was blessed. Now, I don't know about you, but I want my household blessed. I want the church of God. I want this house blessed. And we need the presence and the power of God in this church. And if we're not careful, if somebody doesn't keep the door shut and Satan's allowed free reign, listen, if he comes in here with his messengers, we won't have the presence and power of God. And we need to hold fast the door and keep him at the door. I'm going to give you five messengers that we need to keep at the door. Five. And I'm not going to elaborate on all of these. I know the time. Oh, no, I don't. I don't have a clock. What a shame. (laughs) Robert often says to me, you know we've got a time limit. We've got to be out of there by 12 o'clock. Doesn't worry me. Hey, listen, if God comes into this place and takes over, we're not going to be worried about the time. We just want God to speak to us. Listen, somebody needs to shut the door on the messenger of condemnation. The messenger of condemnation. Do you know what condemnation is designed to do? Condemnation is designed to make someone feel bad. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Do you know if you're saved this morning, you're not under condemnation? Do you know if you're saved this morning that that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life? I'm looking forward to the message tonight on eternal security. I'm glad that I'm saved by grace. I'm glad that I'm saved by His power. I'm glad that I'm kept by His power. I'm glad that, uh, that I don't do anything to get saved and I can't do anything to get unsaved. I'm glad for... For the eternal security, I'm glad that Jesus indwells me, empowers me. I'm glad that he's mine. I'm not under condemnation. I'm not going to die and go to a devil's hell. I'm going to die and I'm going to go to heaven. I'm not under that condemnation. But do you know what Satan wants to do this morning? He wants to come knocking around your place. He wants to send his messages. And he wants to send messages to you to put you under condemnation. He wants to come around and tell you. You know that mistake that you did the other day. By the way, he calls it a mistake. He never calls it sin. We don't like to use the term sin anymore. We don't like to to call out sin. We call it mistake. I made a mistake the other day. Well, a mistake is a lot softer, isn't it? I I can handle using the term mistake. So he has his messengers come around and says, you know that mistake that you did the other day? Yeah, I remember that. God's not going to forgive you for that. Oh, you know what you did back here? You know the thoughts that you had the other day? Do you know the actions that you did? And he comes along with his messengers and he comes and brings a message of condemnation. But can I say to you that you need to shut the door to that messenger and you need to hold him fast at the door and don't let him into your life. Don't allow Satan to come in and spread messages of condemnation in your life this morning. You're saved by grace. You're saved by the blood. You confess your sin. You know the Bible says that if you confess your sin, that that God will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. But you know, isn't he? I tell you what, I want to be one of those people that stand in line just to kick him into the lake of fire. You know, you want to just sort of, it'll be like, take a number. And it'll be like, Millions of people all waiting in line and only one person can really do it because, you know, one person's not going to kick him in the lake of fire and the Lord fish him out and say, next, and someone else kicks him in, next, someone else kicks him in. I mean, it's going to be done and dusted, isn't it? But we often get that feeling, I want to be the first one in line and just say, see you later, Satan. (laughs) Amen. He wants to be first, I'll fight you for him. But isn't it true that he has messengers that come and wants to sow messages of condemnation? Yes. 
He wants you to feel bad. He wants you to be weighed down. He wants you to be oppressed. Listen, Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Ghost with power. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God is with him. Listen, if you are oppressed this morning, if you're depressed this morning, if you're feeling bad this morning, if you're feeling under condemnation, I want you to know that Jesus didn't save you to put you under condemnation. He saved you to get you out from condemnation. Amen. And we ought to live in that freedom. Listen, you know Hebrews says that we shouldn't have a consciousness of sin. Do you know the Old Testament saints, every time they had to sacrifice, there was a remembrance of sin all the time? Do you know that through the, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we should have no more conscious of sin? Amen. That when you were saved by grace, when Jesus Christ saved you, he cleansed you of past, present and future sin. You shouldn't have a consciousness of sin. It, listen, we're not, we don't, I'm not sinlessly perfect this morning. I wish I was, but I'm not. I know I am a saint who sins. But do you know when I sin and I confess that sin, God forgives me and cleanses me, I should never have a consciousness of sin again. It's done. It's dusted. So somebody ought to shut the door on the messenger of condemnation. Secondly, somebody ought to shut the door on the messenger of criticism. Criticism. Criticism and its twin, sarcasm. I have yet to find someone who is a critic or who criticises that doesn't use the sharp tongue of sarcasm. I'm reading the book of Nehemiah. Actually, I've just finished reading the book of Nehemiah. I'm in Chronicles, but you know the story of Nehemiah. He goes to build the wall and he's got those friends, Sam Ballot and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian, and, and he starts the work of God going. Do you know what Sam Ballot and Tobiah do? They come along and criticize. Have you ever been criticized for doing something? Most preachers, and I guess most people, have felt the stinging barbs of criticism. Can I say this? That you are not answerable to your critics. You're not answerable to your critics. You're only answerable to God. And let me just say this. We may want to shut the door at the messenger of criticism, but God forbid that either or either one of us spreads the message of criticism. It's not our place to criticise. It's not our place to criticise another brother or another sister. It's not our place to criticise our wives or our husbands. It's not our place to criticise. Listen, that's Satan's job to be critical. That's Satan's job to criticise. And do you know what criticism does? Criticism really uh, uh, makes the church impotent. And what I mean by that, powerless, because once you start allowing that spirit of criticism into the church or a spirit of criticism into your home and you start having that critical spirit and, of course, the spirit just doesn't stay there. The spirit wants to rise up and, of course, you criticise by something that you say. And do you know the Bible says that death and life is in the power of the tongue? So you better think before you speak. And that's good for me to say. I have to work on that all the time because oftentimes uh, I open my mouth and it's just to change feet. I'm always putting my foot in it. But though we ought to shut the door on the messenger of criticism, God forbid that either one of us should be messengers of criticism. There are enough brethren, unfortunately, folks, there's enough brethren out there that want to criticise other people that's doing a work of God. I find that shame, a shame. I find it sad to think that there's God's people out there that want to criticise other Christians. Well, you don't believe just like I do. You don't dot the I's and cross the T just like I do. Therefore, I can't fellowship with you. Listen, and then what happens is, is criticism starts coming out. You say, what do you do when someone criticises? You know what Nehemiah did? Nehemiah did this in chapter 4 and verse number 9. He said, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God. You know what you should do when you feel the stinging barbs of criticism? Most often what we want to do is criticise back. Someone criticises us and so our retort is to criticise someone back. Just find a seat there, Ken, you'll be right. Anywhere's a good place. But do you know what Nehemiah did? Nehemiah made his prayer unto God. You know prayer is so powerful that it can shut the mouth of the critic just like that. Either one of us, neither one of us ought to be messengers of criticism. We ought to shut the door at the messenger of criticism. Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse number 9, he says, Strengthen my hands, and he strengthened his hands through prayer. Somebody ought to shut the door on criticism. 
Thirdly, somebody ought to shut the door on the messenger of compromise. We live in a day of compromise. You know what compromise means? Compromise means this. It, it, it means to, to come to an agreement. And in order to come to agreement, you have to give up something. For example, for a married couple, we talked a little bit this morning about marriage. And, and there are some things in a marriage relationship that you have to compromise on. Well, I'll, I'll give up this if I can get this. Or I can do this if I can forego doing this. And so people compromise. You know, in the church of Jesus Christ, we should never compromise on our position. Amen. We should never compromise on our doctrine. Amen. But do you know in, the, in Christendom today, one of the things that is rampant amongst Christianity is compromise. Mm -hmm. And compromise, again, just like uh, a criticism, weakens the house of God. It weakens you as a Christian once you start compromising on your position. I have some very strong convictions on some things. I have a strong conviction on the local church. I have a strong conviction on baptism. And, and we spoke about the bride this morning. I have a conviction about what I believe the bride of Christ is all about. I have convictions on those. And sometimes when you have convictions and you don't want to compromise, you're classed as a legalist. Or you're classed as being hard or harsh. And, and listen, that's exactly what Satan wants. Satan wants uh, us to get around other people that say, listen, you know, uh, we want to come and become a part of your church. But listen, can you compromise on the hymn singing a little bit? Let's introduce some of those other songs. And so therefore, because we want to grow the church, it's like, well, yeah, we could probably do that. We can, maybe we can do half and half. We'll sing some hymns and we'll sing some contemporary songs. And we want to do that to make other people feel happy and welcome. Listen, I have a conviction about hymn singing. Amen. Now, you know, well, does the Bible say about singing hymns by Martin Luther and all of that? No, it doesn't. My conviction on the hymn singing is, is the doctrine that's contained in the hymns. The strength of the hymns. I was, uh, I was watching a video clip this morning uh, from Hillsong in London. And I don't know if you follow Hillsong in London or Hillsong New York or Hillsong in uh, Sydney. Um, I think it was Christmas time. They had a, a, a sleazy night, holy night sort of thing where... The whole play was done up in 1920s cabaret style and, and Christian women were getting up there and jigging around and, and it was just like a cabaret scene. I don't know about you, there's nothing Christian about a cabaret scene. Right. But this one was all, about, was all about voodoo, it was all about the cross was there and it had all these strange looking people getting up on the platform and drums were beating and there was chanting going on and it was just like a voodoo service. But you see, when you start compromising on important things in your church, that's the downgrade. Amen. You start compromising on doctrine, you start compromising on the Bible that we use, and you start, comp stop, you start compromising on the songs that we sing. What, what do we progress to? Well, as a matter of fact, it's not progression as some people want to think it is. It's a digression. That's right. Because I've seen nothing good come from any of that. Because out goes the songs, out go the Bible, and then you've got the screen and all sorts of Bible translations and versions are put up there. And, and then we want to darken and dim down the auditorium and we want to have the lights going and all this sort of stuff. And it becomes a circus, a place of entertainment. I think Spurgeon said that the church is going to become a circus and we're going to entertain the goats. Uh, Spurgeon lived in the late 1800s. I'm reading some books by A.W. Tozer at the moment. He was, a, he was a man that was around in the early 1900s. I think he uh, went home to be with the Lord late 1960s. And I'm reading a book called The Voice of the Prophet. And what he was preaching against in his day is rampant in our day. All because of compromise. That's right. And if we're not careful, and if someone doesn't shut the door to that messenger of compromise... You, your family, or even this church can go down that path. You know, there's, listen, you may not agree with me, and to be honest with you, I don't think a whole lot of people do, 
But, you know, when you start going down that path and, and on that slippery slope and start changing a number of different things and you start holding to some strong convictions about being a Baptist and what a Baptist is all about and then you get labelled this and labelled that and labelled so... I, listen, I've seen, and so has probably Pastor Marsh more than me, we've seen brethren that have changed their name from Baptist to something else to compromise on their Bible version their songs go straight down the tube and some of those churches aren't even around anymore. That's right. I wouldn't compromise on the, of, on the conviction of separation. And yet that's not a, pub, a popular message to preach today either. But hey, you know what? We want revival. We want God to sweep through our churches. I want a personal revival, but I'm not willing to separate. Sometime have a read through Nehemiah chapter 10 when revival broke out in that church. They separated from the people of the world under God. And you know why revival is not happening? Because there's too many church people that are messing around with the things of the world and not the things of God. There's too many churches that are not maintaining their standard of separation and joining hands with every other church denomination and every other church movement. And why you've got all that going on, we wonder why God is not bringing revival. That's because we're messing around with too many other things. You know, spiritual fornication is still in the Bible. You know what fornication is, isn't it? When, 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 uh, when someone messes around with another person, you've got fornication and adultery. Do you know when one of Christ's church, and let me just say this, and I'll, you know, not every church that we have here on the coast is one of Christ's churches, by the way. You start messing around with other churches that may name the name of Christ, but they're not for Jesus Christ, they don't preach the doctrines of Jesus Christ, and they don't take the same standards that Jesus taught. Because that's the definition of a, of a local New Testament church, if that church holds to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And if another church doesn't hold to that doctrine, and then another church goes and messes around and fools around with it, do you know what's going to happen? They're going to be infiltrated. They're going to have to compromise on some things in order to maintain the fellowship. Oh, don't preach so hard. Oh, change this, change that. You can get more people in your church if you dress down. Don't dress up, dress down. Listen, I, I always think that when I got saved, Jesus lifted me up out of. Amen. Why do I want to go back into? Why do I want to look like the world, smell like the world and act like the world so that people think I am the world? When we ought to be dressing up and acting and speaking and, and, and doing all manner of things that point to Jesus Christ. It's because we've allowed the messengers of compromise to come in. Fourthly, somebody ought to shut the door on the messengers of complacency. <coughs> complacency. There's too many complacent Christians today. There's too many Christians that want to have their cake and eat it too. There's too many Christians out there that are just so complacent about the things of God and, and wanting to do things for God and serve God and be intimate with God that they want to do everything else and still, hey, listen, I'm glad that I'm going to heaven. Uh, sometimes, now listen, sometimes I wish we didn't believe in eternal security. See, some Christians believe in eternal security and think, well, you know what, I've got my names written down in the land for good wife, I can't lose my salvation, I'm just going to go and live like the devil. Or I'm just going to be complacent. If I feel like it, I'll do it. We live, we live in, a, we live in a, a feeling age. And I know God created us with feelings. But if you're going to allow your life to be dictated to by your feelings, then you know what? we probably wouldn't see too many of you in church, to be honest. I don't feel like going today. Oh, I just, I've had a bad week. I don't, I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like going to church. I don't, and so we become complacent about the things of God. Oh, by the way, we do want to experience revival, don't we? Mm. I think we need to work on some things. Because we can talk about revival and preach on revival all we like, but until you start making some changes in your life, then you won't experience revival. It's true. And if you don't experience revival, then our church won't experience revival. You know, there was ten, uh, ten spies that went out. Two of them come back and said, man, let's go and get it. We can take that land. And uh, no, tw it was a twelve that went out. Ten two come back and said, we want the land. Ten said, no, we don't. And uh, those that wanted to go had to walk around the wilderness with all those that didn't want to go. And they were affected by those complacent crowd. So for those of us in our church here that want to experience revival, I, I want to experience revival. 
And there may be some others that want to experience revival. Do you know that those of you that don't want to experience revival and get your life right with God and get out of that cesspool of complacency, do you understand that we have to succumb and have to walk through that wilderness with you until you get your life right and straight? (laughs) But that's all right. We can be patient. We can wait. And the reason why people become complacent is because they don't shut the door on the messenger of complacency. And they've entertained the thought and the idea. They've allowed themselves to to be uh, dumbed down in Christendom. Well, somebody ought to shut the door on that. Somebody ought to get some spark happening in their life. You know, if I was to take a survey this morning and on a scale of 1 to 10... 10 being the best, 1 being the worst, where would you be on the scale as far as your endeavour, your fervency, your desire for the things of God, your desire to, you know, to, to be in the house of God? We have always believed in being faithful to the house of God. The Bible says in Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. I look at that and I see the day approaching. You know Jesus is coming back soon, don't you? So if I was to take that verse and to take it literally, that means that Christians ought to be gathering together so much the more. Yet sometimes we feel like we've ticked our box and felt really good because I've been in the house of God once a week. Someone, someone ought to shut the door on that messenger of complacency. Lastly, somebody ought to shut the door on the messenger of contention. Contention. Along with a critical spirit, I think a contentious spirit. A, a spirit that wants to bring strife. The Bible says, only by pride cometh contention. Where you're always at loggerheads, you're always contentious, you're always fighting and, you know, butting heads with people all the time. You know, most times people butt heads because, well, I'm right. I'm right. You're wrong. No, I'm right. And so we go backwards and forwards and because of that pride, pride comes contention. Happens in marriages all the time. Doesn't it, folks? (laughs) Yeah. I told you I was right! (laughs) Said with a nice sweet spirit. (laughs) Man, if you just listened to me, we wouldn't be in the problem that we're in right now. We, uh, anyway, we won't go there. (laughs) Folks, we don't need contention in our lives. We don't need contention in our homes. We don't need contention in the church of Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to shut the door on that. If you're facing, or you've got a contentious spirit, ask God to deal with it. And shut the door and make a decision to shut that door and follow through with that decision with courage. Don't let the messengers of Satan come because in our reading, the Bible says that, he says this, see ye how... This son of a murderer hath sent to take away my head. Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? Satan will send his messengers before him, gain access into our lives, and hot on the heels of his messengers is Satan himself. And there's too many Christian homes being destroyed. There's too many Christian churches being destroyed because they open the door to the wrong messenger. We need, listen, we need, we need men in our homes that will stand up and take a stand. The Apostle Paul said, and having done all to stand, stand. So we need some men to stand and shut the door and hold the door fast. We need some preachers in our churches that are just willing to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. Oh, we all want to experience Revival. But do we want to get up and shut the door on the messengers of Satan that come our way? Let's have every head bowed. Let's have every eye closed.
wondering this morning while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, whether the Spirit of God spoke to your heart this morning. Or we want to experience revival. We want the breath of God to breathe upon us. We want the touch of God. We want God to work in our midst and we want our homes to be blessed and our marriages and families to be blessed and we want our churches growing and we want to see all sorts of things happen. But how many of us are willing to just get up and shut the door? Because somebody needs to shut the door. And maybe you're someone this morning that's had the messenger of condemnation come your way. Folks, I want to say this morning that if you're feeling condemned, that's not God. He convicts, but he doesn't condemn. And maybe this morning you'd like to get things right with the Lord and just bring that before him. Perhaps there's someone here that's experienced the messenger of criticism. Maybe you've even had a critical spirit. Maybe you've struggled with criticising. And I pray this morning that you'd get that right. What about compromise? Maybe there was a day where you stood firm on some things in your life. You had some convictions. But over time you've compromised, you've allowed that messenger to come in. Perhaps your Christian life is a bit complacent. Listen, we don't have enough time to be complacent. Our Lord is coming back soon. There's still a work to be done. And what it needs, it doesn't need complacent Christians. It needs committed Christians. It needs dedicated Christians. It needs Christians that will just make a decision to be part of the household of God, a local New Testament church, and serve God there and support it and be in the house of God. But complacency's come in. What about contention? Oh, listen, there's too many homes being wrecked by contention. Too many churches have opened the door to that spirit to come in and spread its evil message. So heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm wondering how many people God spoke to this morning. The Spirit of God just pricked your heart and said, listen, you need to get that right. You need to shut the door here and shut the door there and stop letting your life and your home be infiltrated. We don't have any music, but let's just take some time before God just to pray and bring some things before him this morning. We can't have revival unless we shut the door. Father, we want to thank you for the opportunity of being in your house today. I think from the preacher to the people in the pew, we all need to take note and shut the door on certain things in our lives. We are foolish to think that we will experience revival and rejoice in our God and see ourselves grow and become strong in the Lord while we allow some things to infiltrate our lives. I trust, Holy Spirit, you've been able to have liberty in the hearts of the people this morning and spoken to hearts. We need to shut the door on those messengers and we don't need to be messengers of the things that we spoke about this morning. So I pray, God, that you would... Be glorified and magnified this morning and I trust you've been able to have free course in our hearts and lives. Bless now as we go our way. Thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. May we be thoughtful on the things of God today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.